I think I speak for everyone when I say that the release trailer for Warframe 1999 absolutely rocked me. But why was everyone so hyped at the prospect of Warframe, but white guy? Well, I know my initial hype reaction was, oh crap, is that Hayden Tenno? Protagonist of the game Dark Sector? The spiritual predecessor to Warframe fully canonized truly in-game? It wasn't, clearly. Arthur, find a terminal. Check in. But, you know, seeing the trailer was enough to remind me that Dark Sector actually existed, and it gave me enough motivation to give it a once-over before 1999 comes out. Is Dark Sector canon has been a long-asked question in the Warframe community, because Dark Sector shares many, many, many blatant themes, designs, and even named concepts with Warframe that, coupled with the fact that both Hayden's suit and his glaive are named seemingly canonical items in Warframe, has led to a lot of speculation about it being an actual, you know, prequel. But for several reasons we'll talk about later, the two just really can't line up. But then, you know, that's where Warframe 1999 comes into the picture, right? DE's gonna take us back to relatively modern day Earth, and during this time period, they're gonna show us humans turning into Warframes and supposedly a genuine prequel to the story of Warframe. Basically, what everyone thought Dark Sector might have been. So now this means that our friend Dark Sector is going into the bin of decidedly non-canon. But even if that is going to be the case, I still wanted to play it to completion and see just how many pieces of Warframe's legacy, and possibly even the 1999 expansion, can be traced back to this odd little third-person shooter for the Xbox 360. Now, I know I just said that Dark Sector is a game released for the Xbox 360, which is true, but if I left it at that, I would be ignoring its complicated but very interesting history. You see, ironically, given the theming of 1999 and Y2K, no, not that one, the original development for Dark Sector began around the year 2000, where hot off the release of Unreal Tournament, Digital Extremes, headed by the one and only Steve Sinclair, decided that the time was right to release a new kind of game. This one was going to be bigger, bolder, and more elaborate. They were planning to make a game where the player takes on the role of an operative in a solar system on the brink, where following a massive destructive event, multiple factions were fighting for power over various outposts and space stations and- Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, so you can clearly tell not only by the elevator pitch, but also the in-engine prototype footage. DE's original version of Dark Sector was much more in line with Warframe than what we ended up getting. But this initial version of Dark Sector went beyond even Warframe in some elements. Thanks to the Wayback Machine, we can see some interviews which talk about Dark Sector promising to be a multiplayer action game set in a persistent online world where player actions would affect the state of the system, and you could be either good or bad, which could potentially put you in conflict with other players, and like, wow, that is a lot. Especially considering DE was intending to make this fast-paced first-person shooter sandbox MMO in the year 2000. World of Warcraft wasn't even out yet. And MMOs looked like this. So for some reason, DE wasn't able to find a publisher for this version of Dark Sector. Okay, that's a bad faith take. By all accounts, DE had just made Unreal Tournament, which was a rapid FPS with online functionality. I think they probably had the development chops to actually make something of substance with this idea. Some of the actual reasons they did cite for this game not materializing were changes in the demands of games in the early 2000s, which, yeah. Consoles were becoming more common, and everybody wanted some of that delicious Call of Duty money. Dark Sector did continue on for several years, shifting gears into being a single-player third-person shooter, with a tech demo being released in 2005 showing many similarities to Warframe, like this proto-proto Excalibur, Lissettes, Grenier Soldiers, this room tile from the Corpus ship specifically, oh yeah, and the freaking Naraman 10-0. The game underwent one last major design shift in 2006, where it went from sci-fi to something set on Earth in an ambiguous, near 21st century time frame. Any MMO stuff was completely stripped out, but in true early 7th gen fashion, the game did ship with two PvP game modes. Yeah, this would be a much more tragic story if we didn't have Warframe now, but hey, with like 15 years hindsight, I think we can view this as an amusing, if rocky, step on the path to developing the Warframe that we know today. And you really can plot Dark Sector as a point on the timeline of Warframe's development, because its engine, originally called the Sector Engine, became the Evolution Engine, the very same one that Warframe is built on. You can also see several assets or details that carried through to Warframe, like 
Hayden's cloaking effect being the same as Loki's, or the Glaive's throw indicator being identical to the one in Warframe. I'd love to say that this game that was originally released on the Xbox 360 in 2008 is easy to pick up and play on the PC now, but I'd be lying. There's no windowed mode, and switching the resolution has a 50-50 chance to either work correctly or break the game to the point that it needs to be put down with Task Manager. And if you need to alt-tab for any reason, you'd better be ready to face the consequences. Turning the resolution to anything higher than 1920 by 1080 also just breaks the graphics entirely. There are fixes for this, but I'm dumb, and I didn't think to check until afterwards. So if some parts of the gameplay look weird, that's why. But the bottom line is, if you wanted to run this game ultra-wide, put it in windowed mode, or even expand the atrocious FOV, you can, with the right amount of tinkering. Hayden Tenno also stuck around from the 2005 tech demo, but now instead of being a space ninja, he's a CIA agent infiltrating a gulag in the fictional Eastern Bloc country of Lazria. Unsurprisingly, given his current occupation, Hayden is here to tie up loose ends, starting with Victor Sudek. Hello, Victor. Uh, thank God you are here. Somehow he knows I sent that message. I just need to know where Mesner is. The Lazarian military is working for him now. They've got a chopper coming in. <coughs> but listen to me. He's trying to get inside the vault. If that happens... As it turns out, though, Victor was infected by the Technocyte virus, another concept that made it into Warframe. But instead of turning you into a four-legged fungal creature, this game's version just makes you a regular zombie. At first. So you see, it was actually totally justified. I mean, would a CIA agent really just execute an informant after they've outlived their usefulness? One of Dark Sector's greatest strengths, in my opinion, is how quick it is when giving you upgrades or new mechanics to play around with. When you start out, Hayden is quite literally just a guy. You have the ability to throw grenades, duck into cover, and shoot. Also, you can do finishers, but those serve little to no gameplay purposes other than getting the game banned in Australia. Dark Sector's gunplay is decent. You'll notice right away that this game is not at all like a single-player version of Warframe. This is a cover shooter, and Hayden moves at incredibly human speeds, and his sprint is described by the game as something that you'll have to literally steer as he barrels forward. Combat encounters against human opponents involve you and your opposition taking cover at different positions, and trying to outflank or flush each other out of cover. And let me tell you, you do not want to get caught out of cover. You might look like Excalibur later on, but that will not stop you getting ragdolled by a shotgun blast. You can also pick up enemy weapons to augment your standard pistol, and they're okay. But the reason that they're mid will become apparent relatively soon. After fighting through the guards, Hayden takes out a helicopter with a conveniently placed rocket launcher, something that I think must have been listed as a requirement for shooters in the 2000s, along with turret sections, obviously. But then Nyx, or Nemesis as this game calls her, shows up and magics all of his bullets back at him, and after a possibly poorly thought out play, Hayden falls into the ocean and gets knocked out, only to wake up with his other target in front of him, the rogue CIA agent Robert Mesner, who is currently planning to use the Technocyte virus to do... something. At any rate, Nemesis stabs Hayden with her blade arm, thereby infecting him with the Technocyte virus. Fortunately, Hayden blows shit up and runs away. He radios into his boss, who tells him to meet up with Yargo Mesnik, a sleeper agent who can give Hayden boosters to fight his infection. As his infection progresses, however, instead of turning into a mindless zombie, Hayden gains the ability to deploy a glaive out of his arm. On the way to meet Yargo, however, you run into the Colossus, the design inspiration for Rhino. But after shooting him a bit, he uh, spins in place and runs away. Once he gets to Yargo, Hayden is given the promised boosters, but refuses to take them, which, I mean, fair. The Glaive is incredibly useful and turns this game from boring slow cover shooter into freaking dark sector. The Glaive, and by extension, many of the other powers you develop over the course of the game, serve to give you these temporary cheats to the established slow cover shooter system. Getting back into the Glaive, it serves as a great tool for taking out enemies without using ammo, as well as grabbing weapons and items, letting you resupply while behind cover, or getting at hidden items placed out of reach. You also unlock the ability to remote control it and chase people down, and also absorb elements and blast enemies with them. The Glaive is front and center on every piece of Dark Sector marketing material, and it definitely earns that position because of this. By the way, those weapons you can grab, they all have a built-in anti-infection lock that activates shortly after you pick them up, and now, of course, you're infected. So you'll get maybe 10-15 seconds with them before they pop in your hands. It creates a really interesting flow of not necessarily 
hoarding weapons and ammo, but moving quick and using whatever tools you can get your hands on before they're gone. For some reason though, this restriction doesn't apply to the really heavy weapons, which would seem like the biggest threat if they got into the hands of the infected and you know what? Never mind. Yargo also gets you access to the black market, the game's main form of upgrades and progression, other than Hayden's infection rapidly evolving wacky new abilities. Here, you can buy new weapons, including ones that don't explode in your hands. You can also install upgrades, which aren't exactly mods, but they serve a very similar role, ways to customize the stats of your weapons. Although these augments are one use only and can't actually be removed from the gun you put them on, so mod with care. You can find a lot of them out in the world, but some are rarer than others. This actually opens up an aspect of the game's economy that I really appreciate, that being how you really can't have everything. And money is pretty tight, even if you scrounge around everywhere. This is because a big part of being able to afford stuff, especially the later guns, involves selling unused guns and items to afford stuff you want. For example, grenades serve very little purpose when you've got a glaive that can be remotely controlled and also explode into fire, so I found that selling any grenades that I came across was a good source of extra funds. Also, funny little detail, but the symbol of the black market is none other than the lotus. In fact, no, this isn't a funny little detail. This is hardcore symbolism. You see, Mesner mentions how a lotus is prized and sought after, but it grows amidst rot and decay, much like the black market, much like Hayden himself, actually. Following this, Hayden learns that the infected are drawn to radio signals, and Mesner is using a transmitter to attract a bunch of them to an old church. Here is where the story becomes much less involved as you fall into a gameplay rhythm of entering a new area, unlocking a new ability, having levels and puzzles that use it, and passing into the next area. You do slowly get exposed to new enemies, however, such as the proper infected, who, in lieu of using the complicated dance of cover shooter shenanigans, elect to just bum rush you and beat you to death. Fortunately, Glaive solves this. This is actually an interesting aspect of Dark Sector that feels like it at least incorporated some of the multifactional elements of the original Dark Sector or Warframe. Some areas have you come across infected fighting Lazarian military soldiers or cleanup squads. If you leave them to it, eventually one side will win out and start attacking you, but you could also take advantage of the chaos and take out as many priority targets as you can before eventually, you know, you become the priority target. Eventually, you end up in a graveyard surrounding a cathedral, where the infected start getting more animalistic and strange. And you finally have your showdown with the Colossus. And this is where I realized, uh, boss fights in this game kind of suck. Oh! One shot? Like, you have a system that seems built around cover shooting and killing bunches of enemies with their own disposable weapons, placing you in a room with no extra guns, no cover, and a giant bulky enemy that has no indicator of being hurt, that throws rocks at you from the ceiling which can kill you in one hit. I don't exactly know how I beat this, but I think all the bullets I fired might not have mattered as much as using the glaive to just absorb fire and lightning to open the Colossus up to a finisher attack. Following that incident, Hayden unlocks a new ability, Shield. This is where the game starts to go from Resident Evil to, well, sorta of Warframe-y? This allows you to tank a ton more damage from enemies and also reflect their firepower back at them. It kind of feels like you're able to, again, momentarily cheat the system of the cover shooter game you're in, and it's up to you to find the opportune moment to use that. Anyway, I forgot about the shield several times and it led to many unceremonious deaths. Hayden also meets Nadia under the church, someone he has an ambiguous history with who blames him for something messed up he did in the past. Hayden tries to get her to leave, but she ignores him and says he has one minute to escape before his explosives he planted blow up the church. Coincidentally, I actually missed the exit hatch on my first attempt to get out of here, so I kind of died, embarrassingly. Following this again, Hayden contacts the AD, who tells him that his next target is a shipping vessel that Mesner is attempting to use in order to export the Technocyte virus to other countries. Hayden's orders are specifically to get a sample, but in accidentally releasing the Stalker, no not that one, he sinks the ship and releases a horde of the most terrifying infected yet. These creatures look much more like Nemesis, the Colossus, and Hayden, but they keep their zombie mindset and allegiances. This is where shit starts really hitting the fan. You see, in later stages of Technocyte virus infection, the host starts growing metallic armor and extended appendages. These new variants mix up the traditional cover shooting encounters and infected hordes you've dealt with before, and require you to stay moving and use your environment. 
The Lajrian military is also upping the stakes, deploying their suspiciously grenier looking heavy troopers. At this point, you're getting less and less actual weapon drops from enemies, so your ammo economy is getting tested. And using the glaive is becoming more and more encouraged, since by this point, it can also absorb one of three elements and also, you know, release those elements in a massive fucking explosion. Also, I think it might be prudent to point this out, because the game sure as hell never does. All of this is Hayden's fault. Sure, Mesner was illegally trafficking Technocyte monstrosities beyond human comprehension to sell to other world governments, but in sinking that ship, Hayden just released an army of Geigerian monstrosities onto the civilian population of Lazria. And given how poorly we see the Lazria military is at dealing with the infested, I mean, the infected, well, Hayden here might have just caused the downfall of an entire country and an outbreak in its own right. My initial thoughts on this were, wow, Hayden sure is a stone-cold CIA agent. He must really believe in the mission and his country if he's doing this. But that can't possibly be the case, because immediately after that, Hayden gets a call from the AD telling him to stand down and that his mission is over. And he rejects it to go save Yargo, who's being kidnapped by Mesner's men. This is because, in addition to being a US sleeper agent, he's one of the last living members of a Soviet Union unit that initially contained the Technocyte outbreak back in the Cold War. But again, why does Hayden suddenly care about human life? I suppose maybe having to face his past with seeing Nadia again, and also seeing Mesner and what he could potentially turn into planted the seeds of this revelation, but I mean, it still feels pretty sudden. Next, you have to fight your way through a train yard to reach Yargo, which is admittedly my favorite looking level in the game. But hey, after the easiest boss battle in the game, killing the stalker gets you a cloaking ability, which is your other major way to cheat enemy encounters, as you'll be invisible for a decent time or until you attack. So it's a great way to get back into position or just say, you know, fuck it, we ball, and deliberately go out of position at the chance of flanking enemies. Hayden frees Yargo and tells him to get away right before Mesner and Nemesis show up again. But Mesner's been unlocking some upgrades of his own, so when Hayden tries to glaive him in the face, he's able to actually mentally control him. Hayden finally ends up taking his booster to stop his infection, but Mesner reveals that he was actually given the same shot, and its real purpose was to turn them both into vessels for the Technocyte virus so that the US military could weaponize the Technocyte. However, things don't really go to plan when Hayden almost drops dead due to Yargo poisoning his booster with Enferon. Oh, right, Enferon. Uh, it's basically the kryptonite to the Technocyte infested, which includes you and Mesner's team of assorted weirdos. You can actually find several upgrades for your guns, which upgrade them with Enferon rounds, and enemies will sometimes use Enferon grenades on you while in combat. You can tell you're taking damage from an Ephron gas because your screen will immediately start trying to sear out your eyeballs. Something that's also interesting is how, in Warframe, gas is one of the most effective damage types against infested enemies. Which, I mean, has 99% gotta be a reference to Dark Sector. Thankfully, Yargo saves Hayden from a 150% damage vulnerability by flushing the Ineferon out of his system after Mesner and his goons leave him for dead. Hayden laments not being strong enough to fight against the Nemesis, and Yargo tells him that he can actually get a similar suit in the basement of the very facility they're in. You fight your way down there and... Okay, can I be honest here? I love the design of Hayden Tenno's suit, especially when compared with regular Excalibur. I don't know. I guess the idea of ethereal techno-organic being wearing military tactical gear is a compelling aesthetic to me. I think it's pretty cool then that they keep that kind of theme for Warframe 1999. Following this, the game's given you all its tricks and toys, and all that's left to increase your power are the last of the purchasable weapons, which cost an arm and a leg. Again, the only real way you're going to be able to afford this higher end stuff is by selling the upgrades and guns you don't need in order to get better gear. These upgrades are ultimately worth it though. The two weapons I ended up with were the Hammer, a genuine hand cannon revolver that fires high caliber bullets which can one tap most enemies at range with a headshot, as well as the Korbov, an assault rifle that is the absolute best weapon in the game. Unfortunately, by the time you actually accumulate enough rubles to purchase it, you've probably only got a few more sections left to play with it. The firefights at this point are genuinely engaging though, because because you've accumulated enough powers and familiarity with the game that you can style on hordes of soldiers and infected. I think this is where the game is at its best, and it's a shame it only lasts for a short while before the nemesis. This is the worst boss fight in the game by far. Every problem I had with the Colossus is amplified here. Bullets seem to be necessary to progress the fight, but you just take so many of them that I ended up 
running out of ammo for both my weapons for the first time in the entire game. And there's no ammo lying around the area for a situation like this either. Plus, Nemesis comes with a one-hit kill melee attack and will hit you with it right after this Blade Clash QTE, so you need to immediately dodge or lose all your progress in the fight. Eventually, she'll imbue her glaive with electricity and throw it at a wall, giving you a chance to get electricity yourself and disable her shield. She goes up on a ledge, you knock her down from the ledge. Do a finisher attack, repeat two more times and don't get killed by the one-hit kill attack. This genuinely felt like the game was padding for time, which was a shame. I mean, I know the game is short, but it's still a bad look when you put up a roadblock this obvious. Anyways, you kill Nemesis and it turns out that she's- <gasps> Gasp! The only other female character in this game in disguise? I'm shocked! She tells Hayden that Mesner is taking Yargo to the Vault, where the USSR locked away the source of the Technosite virus. In the Vault is also something called the Transmitter, but instead of the type of transmitter from earlier in the game that gathers infected to an area, this one is just able to transmit the Technosite virus around the entire world. But like, why did Nadia suddenly have a change in heart? She talked about being in too deep, but that's vague. After this, I think the game realized that you have no ammo, because instead of offering you some way to stock up back to maximum, they just give you a jackal vehicle section. Oh, right, I haven't talked about the jackals yet, have I? Yeah, these things are one of the biggest Warframe parallels this game has. Not only are they similar to the jackals of Warframe, they also just have the lotus plastered on the hood. Unlike Warframe though, these things are piloted rather than being pure robots, and you can actually hijack and drive them. They lose a lot of their magic pretty quickly though, especially in this last section where you get locked onto by missile launchers approximately once every femtosecond. Following this section though, Hayden finally enters the Dark Sector. Oh, that's why they call it that. Here you get to actually meet up with the AD, who tells Hayden that he's done, and that the US military has reached a deal with Mesner in the interest of weaponizing the virus. He gives Hayden another booster, again the same type of one that Mesner used, which causes Hayden to flip his shit and kill literally everybody. The implication here is that the boosters that Hayden and Mesner were laced with weren't designed to prevent the infection, but instead shape it and utilize it. Regardless, Hayden goes into the vault, saves the Yargo and tells him to seal the place and throw away the key. Inside the vault itself, Hayden finds the source of the Technosite virus, a US submarine that surfaced in Lazria during the Cold War. You then find Mesner and the Technosite transmitter, which takes the form of giant monster boss battle. This fight is actually semi-bearable, as you just have to open up his arms and hit them with an electrified glaive, and the times you're supposed to shoot the boss are very clear. And you kill the boss. Hayden grabs a piece of electrified metal with his regular fleshy hands, and the game ends. Yeah, you heard me right. The story sort of just ends here. The game hits you with the he was bad, but now he's good bit and rolls credits. And you know what? I'll say it. I was disappointed. I wanted more story out of this game. I wanted to see what Hayden would get up to more. So I guess this is where we try and put everything together and make some sort of conclusion based on the game's themes. At first I thought there wasn't much to work with, but as it turns out, Dark Sector had a prequel comic. This further fleshes out the background and history of Lazria to some pretty horrifying results. While the submarine in the vault only implies it, the comic all but states that the Technosite virus was a weapon engineered by the US government during the Cold War and was intentionally released in Lazria. Furthermore, to contain the initial outbreak, the USSR had to drop an actual nuclear bomb on Lazria. This is some crazy stuff to have just be relegated to an obscure piece of reading, and makes me think about what this game's story might have been if it were just a couple hours longer. The game's thesis appears to be that, just like with the Lotus, good and beautiful things can emerge from the worst places. Most notably how Hayden mentally grew from being a cold-hearted killer into a real human being, and a real hero, and physically emerged from the terrifying process of technocyte infestation into a badass cyber ninja. I think this is a compelling character arc, which is why it's weird then that the game seems to shift the blame of Hayden's killings onto the boosters the AD gave him, but he specifically says he thinks that this is the case, so maybe it means he's trying to shift the blame? I don't know. And we never will know, because the second Hayden locks in and destroys the evil monster that's going to infect the world, the game ends. No talk with Yargo, no indication of what Hayden's going to do now that he's a wanted man and half infected, nothing. And I mean, yeah, considering what DE's current priorities are, I think we can say Dark Sector Story isn't getting a follow-up anytime soon. Or anytime... ever. Earlier in this video, I said we don't have to mourn the loss of the original Dark Sector concepts, since they came back in Warframe. 
But I do think it's a shame that we won't ever get to see what DE was clearly setting up with this setting and its lore. I guess the way things played out is still better than an alternate universe where Dark Sector popped off and Warframe never existed though. But hey, with the amount of concepts that Warframe inherited from this game and what we've seen so far with 1999, I think it's a safe bet to say that we'll see similar themes and characters in Warframe's next expansion. Overall, I'd say I like Stark Sector. The story and setting range from serviceable to interesting depending on how invested you are in hunting down supporting media, and the gameplay loop is incredibly solid. I don't think I experienced any bugs during my time playing either, but the PC port is objectively atrocious. Since the game constantly sits at $10 on Steam and never goes on sale either, I think it's safe to say that DE knows it's nothing to be proud of. But if you can stomach the technical issues, or are one of those tech wizards who loves to download fixes and tweaks for old PC games, I think you'll have a good time with this one. I know that even before Warframe 1999, the chances of something like this were slim, and now they're basically non-existent, but I think some kind of remaster, not even a graphic graphical overhaul, just something to make this game run bearably on modern hardware would be incredible. If only from a game's preservation angle, because the fact that this game shares so much of its DNA with Warframe makes it an amazing piece of history in the form of a game that you can play through. But yeah, that's all I got. Man, I really had no idea how long of a video this would be. I sort of just sat down, started writing, and then I suddenly had a 10 page script in my hands. I definitely didn't dislike the process, but I think I'll be gunning for some shorter videos before I try something of this scope again. For now though, I'll just say you all should get your Crimson Archon shards ready, and I'll see you in the next video.